Welcome to Tisky Sour. Apologies if you've had a difficult day today. Midweek, Wednesday, sometimes feels rough. Boris Johnson's was probably worse. He conducted, I mean, his, 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 I, I, I've lost count of his U-turns, in fact, but there was a pretty dramatic one yesterday, and he had a pretty difficult PMQs, and then a pretty difficult session in front of MPs in the Liaison Committee. He is, in short, a mess. Dahlia. Someone who is not a mess is 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 back on Tisky Sour. I think it's been a little while, hasn't it? How have you been? Don't, don't speak too soon, Michael. I've had it's been a really like busy month. I had firstly my body broke, and then my tech broke, and that's why I missed the last two uh, the last two Tiskies. But I'm so glad to be back, <laughs> and I missed well, you all. Well, you look the opposite of a mess. It's 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 lovely to have your your glowing face back on the show. We are also going to be talking about a completely disgusting speech that Keir Starmer gave to Labour Friends of Israel yesterday. Uh, another disgusting article written by Rachel Johnson. And hopefully, um, if I put it together very quickly, uh, a story about a disgusting man, Stanley Johnson. As ever, if you haven't already, do hit that subscribe button, tweet your comments and your questions on the hashtag Tisky Sour, or put them in the comments box below. If Boris Johnson had accepted Owen Paterson's 30-day suspension for breaking lobbying rules, the now former Tory MP would already be halfway through his punishment. Instead, because of the Prime Minister's attempt to defend a corrupt friend, the country has been beset by 16 days of debate about MPs' corruption. Owen Paterson has resigned, the Conservatives have fallen behind in the polls, and as of yesterday, Boris Johnson has shifted to favour the banning of MPs moonlighting as consultants. It is a sequence of events that has delighted Labour and infuriated Tory backbenchers, many of whom now fear they could lose a valued source of extra cash. At Prime Minister's questions today, Keir Starmer went in on the attack. Across the country and belatedly across this House, there is now agreement that Owen Paterson broke the rules and that the government should not have tried to let him off the hook. Many members opposite have apologised. The business secretary has apologised for his part. The leader of the House has apologised for his part. But they were following the Prime Minister's lead. So will he do the decent thing and just say sorry for trying to give the green light to corruption? Yeah. Mr Speaker, yeah, well, yes, as I've said before, it certainly was a mistake uh, to conflate the case of an, indi an individual member, no matter how sad, with the point of principle at stake. And we do need, we do need a cross-party approach on an appeals process. We also need, Mr Speaker, a cross-party approach on the way forward. And that's why we've tabled the proposals that we have to take forward the report of the Independent uh, Committee for Standards in Public Life of 2018 uh, with those two key principles uh, that everybody in this House should focus primarily and above all on their job here in this House and secondly that no one should exploit their position in order to advance the commercial interests of anybody else. That's our position Mr Speaker. We want to take forward those reforms. In the meantime perhaps he could clear up from his proposals, uh, from his proposals, whether he would continue to be able to take money as he did from Mishcon Dorea and other legal firms. Oh, 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 Prime, Prime Minister, Prime Minister, as you know, and I do remind you, it's Prime Minister's questions, not Leader of the Opposition's questions. Keir Starmer. That's not an apology. Everybody else, everybody else has apologised for him, but he won't apologise for himself. A coward, not a leader. As you saw there, throughout PMQs, Boris Johnson responded to any question about Tory corruption with reference to Keir Starmer's work for the law firm Mishkon Dorea when he was an MP, but before he was Labour leader. As we've said on this show before, that work for the firm, and especially Keir Starmer's account of it, is a little bit problematic, but the issue pales in comparison to the whiff of corruption encircling the Tories, and it was, at PMQs there, an obvious dead cat. Unfortunately for Boris Johnson, later in the afternoon, he was questioned by the chairs of the most important Commons Select Committees. When Chris Bryan asked him about Owen Paterson, deflection proved harder to pull off. Do you think that Owen Paterson was guilty or not? 
I think it was a, a, a very sad case, but I think there's no question that he had uh, fallen foul of the rules on, on paid advocacy as far as I could see from the report. I think the question that uh, people wanted uh, to, uh, to establish was uh, whether or not, given the uh, particularly tragic circumstances, uh, he'd had um, uh, the, a, a fair right to, to appeal. And he had an appeal. His appeal was heard endlessly. Um, both by the, uh, but by the committee. Yes, I, I, Mr. Brown, I, I, and I wish to to, to restate that um, informing the impression uh, that um, uh, the, the former member for North Shropshire had not had a, a fair process, uh, I may well have been uh, mistaken. I may, and it, but that was certainly the the impression that many people seem to have. Theresa May said yesterday that your actions over this case were misplaced ill-judged and just plain wrong. Well, I, look, I, I've, I think I've said several times now that I, I do think it was a mistake uh, to conflate, as, as we did, those, those two things, uh, a particularly uh, difficult case. Uh, it, it's not often in uh, our House of Commons when a colleague uh, suffers a, a family bereavement in the course of uh, an investigation um, there, there, was, there was quite a lot of feeling about it and um, for that reason, in a spirit of, of compassion, uh, I thought it might be useful to see whether there was any, uh, any, any cross-party support. But you didn't approach cross-party at all, did you? you? You told John Whittingdale that there was a cross-party agreement to set up this committee, but that wasn't the case, was it? So, so it would seem. Well, why did you tell him that? Well, I, sorry, I, I, I can't comment on, on that conversation since I didn't uh, have it. But um, what, I, what I can say is that I believed that there would be uh, cross-party support for the idea. How did uh, you believe this? Just out of your head, you came up with it? Uh, it, was, it, was, it was put to me that uh, people... By whom? Uh, by colleagues. Uh, that people would feel, and, and, and indeed, I, I was um, fortified in this by the, by the reflection that many people would have felt that this was a particularly difficult uh, and sad case, and many people across the House uh, would have felt a, a degree of sympathy uh, for uh, the, the member for Shropshire North and, and, and would have thought but the, that in, but those, the particular, in those is... particular circumstances uh, that there might have been, it might have been possible uh, to consider whether the the, the process uh, was capable of, of improvement, and I I'm, I'm very uh, and the, and accept, the, and, yeah. I'm very willing to and accept that uh, I was mistaken in that in that belief. The, the problem is that you say that the country is not corrupt, but what Owen Paterson did was a corrupt practice. It was lobbying um, ministers and officials on behalf of his paying clients. It's a corrupt practice. Yeah, I, I and that. the danger is that you've just tarred up, but by all of this, you've tarred the whole of the house no. with the same brush and yourself, haven't you? Uh, it was, as I said, if you, if you recall what I said, Mr. Bryant, at the at Prime Minister's questions on that Wednesday, I began by saying uh, that paid advocacy uh, is, uh, and, and lobbying uh, is against the rules and anybody who does that should be uh, properly penalised. I, I, that was that was how I began. So the intention genuinely was not to exonerate anybody. Uh, the intention was to see whether there was some way in which, on a cross-party basis, uh, we could um, uh, improve the system. Now, in in retrospect, okay. in retrospect, it was okay. obviously obviously mistaken uh, to think that we could conflate the two things. And uh, do I regret that decision? Yes, I certainly do, uh, Mr. Brown. That was Boris Johnson looking a lot like a naughty child who had been caught out. Um, as I say, slightly more difficult for him to throw the, the distraction techniques in that more toned down setting of a liaison committee question and answer session. Dahlia, it has been a terrible two weeks for Boris Johnson. The U-turn yesterday in particular has pissed off some of his Tory backbenchers who don't like losing extra cash. He looks weak. Is he on the ropes? 
I think it, it's really, I mean, that clip that we just saw was absolutely just, it was very uncomfortable to watch. And I think it is very frustrating to see the amount of excuses and the extenuating circumstances that are being given uh, to the, to uh, Owen Patterson that are not given for everyday people who are trying to go about their lives. You know, if you miss a universal credit meeting or if you miss a meeting, you know, at the job center, you are penalized. And yet we are being asked to, to have all these extenuating circumstances and all this sympathy that Boris Johnson just doesn't seem to have really for many other people other than his his own uh, colleagues. But I think it's it's really interesting that this is sticking. Um, and it's unusual for anything to stick. You know, this government is made of Teflon, it seems. It's survived so many scandals that, you know, feel as great or in fact even greater um, than this one. But honing in on this particular moment, I think it, it says something that this has been the thing to dent um, the Tories in the polls because it is so difficult to excuse. I think when it came to uh, the handling of the pandemic, even though it was, of course, inexcusable, as we've spoken about so many times on this show. But there was all this language that they were able to couch in to get away with it, to say, you know, this is an unprecedented moment. It's, uh, it's you know, we're doing the best that we can with what we know. And you can hide behind false slogans like, you know, we're just following the science, even though Boris Johnson has repeatedly gone against his top scientific advisors. Uh, I think that the reason that this is cut through is is less because of Keir Starmer, um, who doesn't have much of a leg to stand on when it comes to this issue, but but more with the fact that it really lays bare in, in a way that can't be excused very easily. The fact that so many people feel and know on an instinctive level that they are living in a, in a broken political system. And I think the idea of, of sleaze doesn't really convey the the systemic nature of why this is. It's not just sort of moral failings of a couple of individuals, but it's actually this idea of parliament being an MP, being seen as a sort of stepping stone to networks that can get you even more money rather than a job in and of itself. Uh, that is something that's endemic in our state. Um, and I don't think that the idea of sleaze or sort of individual moral failing really, really conveys that. But the, the Tories should be very worried because this is, it's sort of an echo of history. It's something that the Tories have historically not been able to shake very easily. Uh, in the 1990s, you know, the sense that the Tories were endemically corrupt and endemically sleazy, it wasn't a small part of how Labour won with such a landslide. It wasn't the main reason. The main reason was the Murdoch press being in favour of Tony Blair, but it certainly played a role. And I, I wonder if you know, for the people who have living memory of, of that moment, if this is sort of opening and reopening up historical associations uh, between the Tories and, and, and this sort of sleaziness, this corruption, and this idea that basically MPs are not there to serve their local constituency. They're there to fatten their pockets with, you know, the networks and all of the kinds of access that being a politician affords you. And that's seen as like a strategic position, a strategic career move rather than someone who is committed to a particular community of people and representing that community of people in our parliament. We've got a super chat from Kieran Buckley. How long till the Tories are back with a 10 point lead in the polls? Um, it's an interesting question. They are, you know, as I said in my introduction, they, ha they have fallen behind Labour in a, in a few polls for the first time in a while. The only chance Labour have of, of winning the next general election is if Boris Johnson just keeps making mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake, because Labour haven't offered people an alternative vision of, of what they could offer. Um, Boris Johnson and the Tories, in fact, have a more coherent vision, I think, or at least a more coherent message to give to the public, not that it's necessarily consistent. Apart from on this issue where Boris Johnson is clearly much more sleazy than Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer, not particularly honest, we talk about that quite a lot, but Boris Johnson is 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 more ill-suited to public office, I think. So it, it could be the case that this becomes a consistent lead for Labour if Boris Johnson keeps fucking up. I mean, Labour are doing a risky strategy where the only way they could possibly stay ahead in the polls is if Boris Johnson keeps messing up and messing up and messing up over and over and over again, um, which is obviously not the, the best position to be in. Um, let's talk about what's going to happen next. Boris Johnson's letter to Lindsay Hoyle yesterday means that some form of changes to the rules for second jobs is on the horizon. We go to a couple of the key bits. Um, so he brings up, he repeats some recommendations from the 2018 report 
from the Standards Committee, something which Boris Johnson had previously ignored, but he's now dusted off. Um, they read the recommendations here. Um, recommendation one, the Code of Conduct for MPs should be updated to state that any outside activity undertaken by an MP, whether remunerated or unremunerated, should be within reasonable limits and should not prevent them from fully carrying out their range of duties. And that's sort of seen a bit of a reference to, to Geoffrey Cox, who when he was on the British Virgin Islands, presumably couldn't carry out his, his duties as effectively as, as an MP would be expected to. And then recommendation 10, the code of conduct for MPs and guide to the rules should be updated to state MPs should not accept any paid work to provide services as a parliamentary strategist, advisor or consultant, for example, advising on parliamentary affairs or on how to influence parliament and its members. MPs should never accept any payment or offers of employment to act as a political or parliamentary consultants or advisors. Um, the letter goes on to say, these two recommendations form the basis of a viable approach which could command the confidence of parliamentarians and the public. That's, that's according to the government believes that to be the case. This is obviously a dramatic U-turn. Um, what it means in practice is slightly less clear. In particular, there are ambiguities as to what counts as a parliamentary strategist, advisor or consultant. It's that, that word at the beginning, parliamentary. If you're a consultant, but it's not a parliamentary consultant, would you be allowed to continue with the job? It's telling that so far no senior Tory has been able to confirm that that recommendation would definitely rule out Owen Patterson's Randox job. So it's not clear that this is going to catch those jobs that people have found so so insulting for, for MPs to hold. Keir Starmer has said it doesn't go far enough. He wants to ban all second jobs for MPs with very limited exceptions. That's a, that's a quote. Um, so presumably that would, that would catch more people in that net. And ultimately, more precise rules will be drawn, drawn up by the Standards Committee. That's chaired by Chris Bryant. After that, Boris Johnson will have to decide whether he will whip MPs to vote for it or not. Dahlia, do you think the sequence of events, the, a, a new set of rules that the Standards Committee draws up, do you think that corruption could be cleaned up? Is Boris Johnson under so much pressure that he's going to have, you know, he's going to struggle to sort of go back on all of this and say, well, actually, they can continue with the consultancies as long as they follow these sort of marginal and, and insignificant rules? No, I think that it has to be a sort of blanket rule because when you try and go in with these technicalities, who's who's holding people's feet to the fire? Who is doing the oversight here? I think a clear message of, you know, you cannot take on second jobs while you are an MP because being an MP, being a representative for your community, for your constituency, is more than a full-time job. If you're doing it properly, it's more than a full-time job. And then the the slight exceptions can be things like if you're in public office, um, in public service. So, for example, I don't know, public, the public sector in some cases. So like when Nadia Whittam uh, during the lockdown worked in a care home again, those kinds of very specific roles. That's very different. You're not representing sort of lobbied interests, but you need to have a very, very clear mark because it's also not just about taking on second jobs in, you know, officially on the books. It's also about the overall way in which our politicians are able to get away with being so cavalier and taking for granted their roles as MPs. So whether it's from, you know, safe seats being given away to people who are not good MPs, people who are not good at being an MP, people who don't particularly care about the constituency they've been given, but being given a safe seat as a sort of return on a favour, uh, which is something that we actually that happens a lot in our political system or whether it's you know MPs doing the bidding of particular industries while they're in government and then suspiciously when they are for whatever reason no longer in government uh, go on to serve on the boards of these industries you know a good example is uh, Angela Smith of uh, of funny tinge fame when she you know left she was like suspiciously in line with the private water industry's politics she was chair of the APPG on water and was suspiciously you know backing from the back benches moves to privatize water or continue privatizing water and you know it was all kind of strange and then when she leaves her job as an MP when she loses her seat she suddenly ends up on the board of a major of the of a major company in the water industry. So it's not just about 
you know, this is not having a blanket rule, I think, on not allowing people to have second jobs while they are MPs is really important. But it's also a broader culture of what do people, what kind of people is the role of MP actually drawing? How can we make being an MP more accessible to people who don't have these other interests and other these other uh, other sort of ulterior motives for why they want to become an MP so that we can stop this idea of an MP being seen as a means to an end, a means to a more powerful or a more lucrative career, but rather the job in itself. And that seems to be that kind of culture of being a constituency MP is basically extinct if it ever really did exist. And I think, so I think it's not it's it, this is an important step, but I think bringing back this accountability of what it means to be a constituency MP, to be embedded in your community and to represent that community in Parliament effectively is is absolutely crucial. And that's something that's absolutely been lost in the way that the British state is is run. Mm. No, because there are I was having an interesting conversation with Aaron about this on a recent show as well, where I suppose the distinction he was making, I think you're making a similar one, is you can say what we need to do is tighten the rules so that the same bunch of people can't fulfill their desires to essentially get rich, um, you know, partaking in actions which might be seen to be against mm. the, the public interest. Or we can have democratic reform that mean we have completely different people in parliament. I mean, obviously, they're not mutually exclusive, mm. but we can focus on, on, on one or the other. So you might argue that what we need is, you know, open primaries or what we need is proportional representation. So we don't have people who are so secure in their yeah. you know in incredibly powerful privileged position that they just get to stay in some safe seat for 40 years and actually never really have to prove themselves to yeah. to anyone because once they've been granted that job mm. it's a job for life and mm. you know they might as well go off and try and get some extra cash doing consultancy work yeah absolutely i i grew up in a very very safe labor seat a seat that's never been anything other than labor no one in my community can tell you the name of our mp I, you know, I happen to know who, who the MP is because I'm involved in politics, but he's so absent from the local, and that's not because people in my community don't have issues that they need their MP to attend to. That's actually the complete opposite, but it's because there is just absolutely no interest. There's no investment. There's no, he doesn't feel any need to, to be connected to us, to be connected to our community because we are guaranteed numbers to him and people know that and people feel that and i think the reason why the concept of sleaze really sticks and people feel quite it, it kind of sticks in a way that a lot of other things haven't stuck to this government is because it is sort of an avatar for how people feel about this broken political system and how unrepresented people feel by this broken political system. And whilst they might not know the ins and outs of why exactly that exists, there is a sense of, I know that my MP is actually not serving me and is actually not interested in the things that matter to me and people in my community. I don't know exactly, and this kind of, I guess, gives an explanation as to why. And I think it, it's part of the explanation, but it's not the whole explanation. But I think, yeah, that that idea of, of how do we create a culture where the constituency MP and being a good constituency constituency MP is the sole focus of our of our government that is going to require more democratic accountability, which a lot of MPs are going to be very uncomfortable with because it removes that, as you said, job for life comfort that that so many that so many feel. And it's why we lost the red wall. I think I honestly do think a big reason why we lost the red wall um, is because a lot of MPs in northern seats believed that they were in a safe seat and were lazy, uh, and people people reach a breaking point when it comes to that kind of thing. And sometimes they just need one thing to push them over the edge. That might have been Brexit, it might have been something else, but that disillusionment and disenchantment and that association with labor, between labor and passivity and incompetence and distance from local communities, that was festering for a really long time. And it fell in one sort of, in one moment, but it, it was a much longer history that I would connect to this change in culture of what MPs think they can get away with. I do think it is important to keep repeating, you know, that when it comes to like this blatant sleaze, working for consultancies, getting shed loads of money on the side, Labour and the Tories aren't the same. There are 28 Tory MPs who work for outside consultancies. There's only one Labour MP who does. What you were just saying, though, Dahlia, did remind me of a Labour thing, which is that in the constituency where I'm from, not where I, I, I live now, 
the MP also, well, the MP doesn't live there because he lives in a different constituency with his wife, who is also an MP, who is the sister of an MP. And this MP who lives in a different constituency, both his parents were Labour MPs. So you, you, do, you do get the idea that something not quite right is going on here. If you can guess what constituency I'm from, put it in the comments. Um, let's go on to our next story that's very... Un oh, no, actually, first of all, let's go to some great super chats. Um, Saul with a fiver. If we're banning MPs from having second jobs, what about banning them from being landlords too? Or is being a parasite in the housing market acceptable? I agree with that one. So, I mean, I would ban all landlords. I think landlordism is just, you know, completely unproductive part of our economy that there's you know, no rational reason to keep but i would i think it's you know it's even more damaging that we have people representing us who are who are landlords who are tied to this vested and unproductive interest and um, blaster chief tweets on the hashtag tisky sour i find myself being less and less able to stomach the pantomime of politics been seeing some controversy over today's pmqs can't bring myself to watch it otherwise i might cringe so hard my spine will smash my pelvis into diamond wow uh, that's uh a, a very graphic um, description of, of how you feel. Um, the the point you make there is interesting. I didn't focus on it on this show because I, I, like you, found it incredibly tedious and boring. But there was a controversy today because Boris Johnson tried to, you know, as I said, tried to pretty cynically bring up Keir Starmer working for Mish Kondorea. Then the speaker had to tell him to sit down. He said, this is unparliamentary. Then Keir Starmer called him a coward. And that was unparliamentary. It was all, you know, it's just completely ridiculous. Um, so I didn't go into that, but that has been a big story on, on many of the channels today. And Bob Bobbing with a fiver says, Johnson sounded hoarse today, wheezy and chesty in his coughs. In short, he looks and sounds ill. Given he is loose with masks, has he got COVID again? Interesting theory. I would presume the guy is taking, you know, lateral flow tests every day. Uh, obviously, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I, I would hope he is. Um, we'll, we'll have to wait and see, I suppose. We have 2,000 people watching, only 400 likes. Give us a like. Helps us on the algorithm. Next related story. Boris Johnson's last-minute U-turn on moonlighting MPs has thrown a cat among the pigeons on the Tory back benches. And after Prime Minister's questions, Patrick Maguire from The Times shared some leaked WhatsApp messages from Tories expressing their concern. MP Kevin Hollinrake was among them. He messaged this Tory WhatsApp group saying... Is anyone else concerned that allowing the commission to determine which of us are prioritising outside interests over their constituents and are then investigated and appropriately punished makes us subordinate to an unelected official? Simon Hall says, yes. Now, I imagine viewers will have lots of sympathy with the concerns of this NP, Kevin Hollinrake and Simon Hall, who, who agrees with him. That is unless you've ever had an ordinary job, which paid much less than £82,000, and where your conditions, just as Holland Rake is, is complaining, weren't set democratically, and where it would not have been, you know, been seen to be normal, by the way, if you just had a, a second very well-paid job. Another Tory MP, Nigel Mills, said the following, As written yesterday, the rule could either catch nothing, and so be pointless, or prohibit nearly everything with the decision being subjective and retrospective. We would be far better setting out an earnings and or hours cap than having such a vague rule. Jackie Doyle Price then re responds, or leaving things as they are. Poor, poor Jackie Doyle Price, who despite the outrage over Owen Patterson, Jeffrey Cox and Ian Duncan Smith just wants to leave things as they are. Could the Tories not just ignore the pesky public and continue working in lucrative lobbying jobs? And no one thought of that. It's so simple. None of these leaked messages, however, constitute the most ridiculous defence of the status quo offered by a Conservative this week. That accord instead goes to Andrew Rosendell. Here he is speaking to the BBC after Boris Johnson announced plans to ban consultancies. I'm very cautious on this because I know that some of my colleagues have jobs and outside work that they do, and that means them having to give up changing their lifestyle. We have to be careful about this. We have to realise that we're dealing with human beings who have families and responsibilities. So whilst, as I've said before, the duty, first duty must be to Parliament, to constituency and to the work we do for our country, uh, any changes I think should be evolutionary. 
I'm very cautious on this because I know that some of my colleagues have jobs and they might need to change their lifestyles. These are human beings with families and responsibilities. That was Andrew Rosendell suggesting that a person with an £82,000 salary might not be able to fulfil their family duties unless they get a side gig as a lobbyist. I am, of course, filled with sympathy for these people whose basic salaries put them in the top 5% of earners. And I'm impressed that Rosendell takes seriously how painful it can be to have to change one's lifestyle due to cash flow problems. Or at least, Rosendell takes it seriously with respect to MPs. Because for everyone else, well, it turns out Rosendell couldn't give a damn. Here he is in July this year explaining why he supported the £20 cut to universal credit. I think that this is a balance. It has to be judged very carefully. Uh, I think there are people that quite like getting the extra £20, um, but maybe they don't need it. So there needs to be How do you know? proper... Because people are all different in different circumstances. So you can't box everyone into the same category. But the government has an overall responsibility to deal with the national finances as well and that's what they must now do. I think there are people that quite like getting the extra £20 but maybe they don't need it. How do you know the interviewer asks because people are all different in different circumstances. Let's look at what those differing circumstances might be. So if we're talking about universal credit excluding support for housing and childcare this is the rate people were entitled to before and after last month's £20 per week cut. This information is from Citizens Advice. So what this shows is if you were single and under 25 before the cut you got £344 a month. After the cut that went down to £257 per month. If you were single and over 25, you got £411 a month before the cut, £324 a month after the cut. Living with a partner and you're both under 25, you get £490 between you before the cut, after the cut. Over a month, you get £403 to share between you for a whole month. Living with a partner, um, if you're both over 25, before you got £596 a month, now £509 a month. So to be clear, what all this means is that Andrew Rosendell thinks that single people over 25 might be able easily to live on £324 a month. And that while they might like an extra £80, they probably don't need it. Andrew Rosendell also apparently thinks that couples over 25 won't need more than £509 a month between them. Finally, what's not shown on the previous chart is the child element of universal credit. That's around £250 for each of your first two children because of reforms introduced by George Osborne. Third children um, aren't entitled to any money. That's how that Tory government fought and worked. This all means that a family on universal credit is expected to live on roughly £1,000 a month. That's, of course, to pay for food, bills, council tax, school uniforms, clothes, heaven forbid, maybe even a holiday once in a while. But Andrew Rosendell thinks such a family might well not need an extra £80 a month, even if they might want it. Now let's compare the situation of people on universal credit to members of parliament, those people who Andrew Rosendell thinks do need that extra cash. MPs are on £82,000 per year. That will, of course, be taxed. So we can use a tax calculator to work out their take-home pay. And this is what you get. So as you can see here, if you earn £82,000 per year, your after-tax income is £56,000 per year per month. That works out as £4,600. It is these people earning over £4,000 a month who Rosendell thinks needs extra income not the people making as little as £273 per month. I want to go back to the clips after we've, you know, now that we've, we've seen these statistics, we've seen the kind of incomes that the two groups he is talking about are on and, and reflect again on what Rosendell said. So this is Rosendell on MPs. I'm very cautious on this because I know that some of my colleagues have jobs and outside work that they do and that means them having to give up changing their lifestyle, we have to be careful about this. We have to realise that we're dealing with human beings who have families and responsibilities. So whilst 
as I've said before, the duty, first duty must be to Parliament, to constituency and to the work we do for our country. Uh, any changes, I think, should be evolutionary. Now, again, let's look at Rosindel on low income Britons on universal credit. I think that this is a balance. It has to be judged very carefully. Uh, I think there are people that quite like getting the extra £20, pounds, um, but maybe they don't need it. So there needs to be How do you know? proper because people are all different in different circumstances. So you can't box everyone into the same category, but the government has an overall responsibility to deal with the national finances as well. And that's what they must now do. Now, after going through those figures and then re-watching those clips, there's one particular line Rosendell uses that jumps out at me. He says, people are in different categories. You can't box everyone into the same category. And I say that jumps out because that's what this is really about, isn't it? It's, it's not about different circumstances, because if we look at the objective circumstances these two groups of people are in, a cut to any MP's overall incomes is a thousand times less concerning than a cut to the income of someone on universal credit. That means that the only way you can square that circle and to say that the MP's cut is more concerning than the cut for the people on universal, universal credit is to say that comparison doesn't make sense because we are looking at people in different categories. In one category, we have people without value, people who live on low incomes and have probably had fewer opportunities in life. If they suffer, it doesn't matter. They might want an extra 80 pounds, but they don't need it. In the other category, we have people with value, people like MPs who've likely been showered with opportunity and now command high incomes. For this category of people, having to remove one's child from an expensive public school or having to forego a holiday in the Bahamas, well, that's a tragedy. Dahlia, I really do think those two clips of, of Rosendell explain so much about Tory ideology. It only makes sense if you put people into different categories. The category, which is, you know, your wealthy chums, if they have to forego something they want to do, that really matters. If someone on a low income has to forego what they want to do, it's, you know, it doesn't matter. Tough luck. I mean, it's so vile, isn't it? It's, it's even just, just the language of, you know, as you mentioned, of, of uh, not banning second jobs in order to protect MP lifestyles. It's, it's, it's a euphemism, you know, for, for a lot of the things that we talked about before, which is that there's this idea that being an MP is about power and wealth right it's not about serving your voters it's not about serving your constituency it's about being in those upper echelons of power being in those powerful rooms and 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 seeing being an mp as a stepping stone essentially to a more lucrative future and a more powerful future a, a means by which you can have access to to the kinds of networks that you wouldn't have access to if you weren't in government uh, it's essentially about being a node in a network of power. Um, and if you can't have a second job, if you you know have to live on a measly 80K, if you can't create the kinds of connections and the networking that having a second job in industry would lend you, then what's the point of being an MP? It takes all the fun out of it. It takes all the glamour out of it. Uh, but the language is also when he sort of says, oh, you know, we need to think of MPs. They are real human beings with families. And as if those for whom, you know, missing out on 20 pounds for uh, if, with universal credit, and you know, that me means that, the, that that is the difference between being able to heat their home in the winter and not being able to afford their energy bill, as if those people aren't human beings uh, with families. And this is where it really does expose Tory ideology, I think, because for many, they just cannot and do not conceptualize working class people or people on low income, on, on low incomes as being human in the way that they are human. Uh, people who, you know, this MP in this position, he sees himself in someone like Owen Patterson uh, and others who, who would be affected by such rule changes, but he doesn't see himself or anyone that he loves or cares about in a universal credit claimant. And this disdain for working class people, this dehumanization for working class people, comes from the core of Tory ideology, which sees poverty as a moral failure rather than a systemic injustice. And it's, it, you know, poor people, they're just bad people. They make 
they're unintelligent, they make bad decisions. And so they have their lot coming to them. They need to be disciplined like children, because if you give them anything, then they'll just misuse it because they don't make smart decisions. You know, it reminds me of when uh, Ben Bradley, the uh, hero of the white working class, uh, said that we shouldn't give working class people free school meal vouchers because it's the same thing as just handing cash over to crack dens and brothels. Uh, so this kind of stereotyping, this caricaturing of working class people and the dehumanization that goes along with it is rooted in that Tory concept of poverty being a moral failure. And it's almost like a prosperity gospel, which is in the sort of US evangelical church, where if you're rich, then being rich itself shows that you're a good person because the act of being, because you wouldn't be rich unless you were a good and smart person. And so the opposite of that is that if you're poor, uh, you're not you're not a good person and you're not a smart person. And that's why, why you're poor. And that's why the Tories treat working class people with such ruthlessness. And yet when it comes to their class bedfellows, they seem to have nothing but sympathy and understanding and empathy, as we saw earlier on when Boris Johnson was answering to to the Owen Patterson scandal, to how he handled it. Uh, and that is basically, it, it's a basically a way of, it's the, it's the ideology that runs through so many things about the Tories that is not just limited to this particular scandal, but it goes through the pandemic, it goes through rushing people back to work in the pandemic, all of these things. It's through basically just not seeing the working class people of Britain or anywhere else as human beings in the way that they recognize themselves and their colleagues as human beings. Uh, and it just, it, it's so, so sickening and vile to watch. It's the only way you can explain what's going on in those two clips. You know, that's, you know, what, what Dahlia is saying might sound radical. You know, it's like, oh, this is just a, another left winger going on again. But there's, there's literally no other way that you can explain what you saw in those two clips. You know, it, I just feel like it's, it's incontrovertible. Uh, Tad Cantwell with a tenor says, at the very least, all landlord MPs should hand over their rent contracts to the state and not get a penny from it ever while in public service. Quite a good idea. Um, as I say, I'd like all landlords to hand over their contracts to the state so we can transfer them into social rent. Um, but that would be a good start. Chris Tyson with two quid. Keep up the good work, Navarro Media. Thank you so much for those kind words. Baz Cams, join a union. GMB helped me yesterday. Um, of course, we 100% concur with that. Do join a union. Um, they, I mean, they can help you out in all, all manner of things. Um, and Christian Williams with a fiver. If MP second jobs go, they'll simply pivot and take a single step down another murky path. Well, ideally, that murky path would involve them leaving Parliament so people who are more fitted for the job can, can take up that role. But I'm sure you're right. They, they will look for loopholes if this opportunity to enrich themselves is removed. Let's go to our next story. Keir Starmer has given a speech to Labour Friends of Israel. The Labour leader was guest of honour at the annual get-together, and he shared the stage with Zippy Hotaveli, the Israeli ambassador. As you can see here, the LFI thanked Keir for attending, and they added... Pointedly, it's so wonderful to be able to welcome the leader of the Labour Party to our annual lunch once again. As you can probably guess, the relationship between Jeremy Corbyn and the LFI was not so close. More notable than Starmer's presence at the lunch, though, was what he said. We can take you through some of the highlights or lowlights, depending on how you feel about occupation and racism. First, a key theme of the speech was to equate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. On this, Starmer said, Anti-Zionist anti-Semitism is the antithesis of the Labour tradition. It denies the Jewish people alone a right to self-determination. It equates Zionism with racism, focuses obsessively on the world's sole Jewish state, and holds it to standards which no other country is subjected. And it seeks to paint the actions of Israel as akin to the crimes of those who sought to annihilate European Jewry in the Shoah. This statement upset a lot of people, understandably, and I think Keir Starmer here is totally wrong. So let's go through it with a fine tooth comb. First of all, we would agree, I would agree, that comparing Israel to the Nazis is ill-judged, usually offensive. Let's put that to one side. As for the rest of the statement, 
Starmer says that what he calls anti-Zionist anti-Semitism denies the Jewish people alone the right of self-determination. Now, this would make sense. It would make sense if there was another ethno-state built on the land of other people that anti-Zionists all accepted with open arms. But I can't think of one. You know, there, there are states which, which, which are built on the land of other people, the United States, for example. But if the United States defined itself as an ethno-state where people of only one ethnicity were, were welcome to become citizens, then I think we'd probably have some problems with that. Keir Starmer also said so-called anti-Zionist anti-Semitism equates Zionism with racism. Again, I'd agree. If anyone believed Zionism was uniquely racist, then that would be problematic. But there's a strong argument that Zionism, as a form of ethno-nationalism, is racist. If we don't accept that citizenship in Britain is dependent on ethnicity, why should we accept it in Israel? That's not making an exception for the Jewish state. That's being consistent. Finally, Keir Starmer says so-called anti-Zionist anti-Semitism focuses obsessively on the world's sole Jewish state and holds it to standards to which no other country is subjected. The riposte to that statement is, is much simpler. Yes, Israel is treated differently. It, does, it is held to different standards. There is, as far as I'm aware, no other nation which has occupied another country for over 50 years and, for which, and which practices apartheid that a Labour leader would proudly address at an annual dinner. Let's move on to another part of the speech. So later on, Starmer says, We will continue to support Israel's rumbustious democracy its independent judiciary, and its commitment to the rule of law. Israel is a nation with a vibrant media, free trade unions, and a lively tradition of debate, dissent, and disagreement, as well as the rights won by the struggle of the women's movement, the LGBT community, and religious and racial minorities. On these points, I'll leave it to Bet Salem, Israel's leading human rights organization, and Human Rights Watch to respond. Both organizations have this year called Israel an apartheid state because, in the words of Betzalem, in the entire area between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River, the Israeli regime implements laws, practices, and state violence designed to cement the supremacy of one group, Jews, over another, Palestinians. I await to hear one of Britain's leading political journalists asking why human rights lawyer Sir Keir disagrees with Human Rights Watch and Betzalem. I won't hold my breath. There is, I assure you, too much that's awful in this speech to show you all of it. Israel is referred to as embodying progressive values. Starmer says other, race, other forms of racism get taken way more seriously than anti-Semitism. And of course, he opposed BDS, boycott, divest and sanction. But the bit I thought was uniquely offensive was the following thing that Starmer said. So. He, I mean, as, as a key part of his speech, he says, Labour leaders, from Harold Wilson to Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, recognised Israel's importance to the community here at home, celebrated its achievements, and stood by it in moments of peril. They rightly saw their counterparts in the Israeli Labour Party, from Golda Meir to Chaim Herzog, Abba Iban, Yitzhak Rabin, and Shimon Peres, have comrades in the international struggle for equality, peace, and freedom. And this is the bit. Social Democrats who made the desert flower, as Wilson put it. Social Democrats who made the desert flower. Now that, that, that is the most colonialist, paternalist, and frankly racist thing I've heard a British politician say in, in quite a while. Israel made the desert bloom. Obviously, there was no one there before the first Zionists arrived. The Nakba, presumably, didn't happen. And Arabs, I presume, can't grow things. I, I can't see how else you interpret that particular phrasing. Finally, the last bit of the speech I'm going to show you is, is, is how it ended. So Keir Starmer said, Under my leadership, Labour will stand shoulder to shoulder with peacemakers and progressives. We'll stand up against those who demonise and delegitimise Israel and its people, or who say Jews don't count. Because under my leadership at the Labour Party, every Jew will count. And we'll stand by our party's long and historic commitment to the world's only Jewish state, Israel. Now, as I hope I've already shown, Starmer's speech unequivocally shows that in his Labour Party, not all lives matter because Palestinian lives don't matter. But what about that claim that at least under him, every Jew will count? 
I'm joined now by Barnaby Rain, a Jewish activist who has written extensively on anti-Semitism and the Labour Party. Barnaby, did that speech make you feel like you, you counted? Do you feel seen by this Labour leader? No, indeed, I thought perhaps the claim that under his leadership, every Jew will count was a terrifying warning to me that if I'm bad at maths, I better get my act together or Keir Starmer will be uh, forcing me to count. Um, this was not a speech on anti-Semitism. Uh, it contained no attempt to explain where anti-Semitism comes from or why it persists. It contained only one example, as far as I can see, uh, other than the Holocaust of anti-Semitism, a, a, a recent uh, farce at a theatre. Um, uh, and from centuries of theories of anti-Semitism and people thinking through its origins, uh, the only authority mentioned was David Badil, who is not a serious scholar uh, of anti-Semitism. Um, it was a speech on Starmer's commitment to support for the state of Israel, but very damagingly, it was presented as a speech about fighting anti-Semitism, which is, of course, very dangerous, because if you tell people that defending me means defending violent expropriation, you risk bolstering anti-Semitism. You perform a conflation, which is, of course, anti-Semitic. Starmer doesn't care about that because he sees anti-Semitism just as he saw Brexit or any other policy choice as just an opportunity uh, to think through how to deal with some polling problems, not as a serious anti-racist would see it um, as a moral problem. And I say that because um, he's, he, he's happy to bolster a conflation between Jews and the state of Israel, which is deeply damaging to Jewish safety and security, uh, but which currently serves not Jewish interests, but the interests of empire and capital looking to use Jews um, as, as part of a racist campaign um, against other minorities to protect, to, to, to cast Jews as a kind of protected minority of white society against the savage hordes, brown people, Arabs, Muslims, and also anti-capitalists and anti-imperialists, so that Europe, Europe's uh, history of anti-Semitism is projected and deflected and cast as a problem that comes from outside. So this is nothing to do with protecting Jews. It's to do with protecting white society and using Jews as a kind of uh, a bulldozer, battering ram uh, in that right-wing campaign. I mean, it poses a serious problem, I think, to Keir Starmer's narrative as well, because uh, w what Labour have been saying or since Keir Starmer became leader and why they've been expelling so many people, including many Jewish people, is because they say that if you say that any of the anti-Semitism row was about Israel, you are essentially denying anti-Semitism and partaking in anti-Semitism. Then in a speech where he says, this is how I'm going to end anti-Semitism, he feels the need to condemn BDS, to say Israel is progressive, to, I mean, essentially deny the Nakba. How does he say, one, the anti-Semitism row had nothing to do with Israel, and two, here in this speech where I'm going to oppose anti-Semitism, I'm also going to you know, declare my love to the land of Israel. I mean, it, 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 it seems confusing, to say the least. Yes, I don't think there's anything strange about Keir Starmer. I don't think there's anything strange about the British Labour Party. The strange thing was Jeremy Corbyn. There was briefly a period in which, within the imperial metropole, uh, there was a party leader who had a genuine history of commitment to anti-colonial struggles and anti-racist struggles. We're now back to the norm, which is British politics is about the defence uh, of empire overseas and, and racism at home. That's always been the mainstream. I mean, just think about this. You mentioned Starmer's uh, appalling comment that Israel made desert flower. In that same comment, he praised Shimon Peres as a leading social democrat. Shimon Peres is a man known across the Arab world for saying, I am at peace as prime minister after the IDF, his army, killed 106 civilians sheltering in a UN compound in Lebanon. This is a man who did a secret deal with apartheid South Africa to try to provide Israeli nuclear weapons, nuclear technology, to a state run then by admirers of Hitler. Shimon Peres is a man who, after the 1967 war, said his ambition was to build, quote, settlements everywhere. A man who blamed Palestinians after Israeli soldiers killed children playing on a beach in Gaza just a few years ago. So to coin a phrase, to the Labour Party leadership, clearly some people don't count. Some victims of racism don't count because the Palestinian people are not uh, simply a victim of Keir Starmer's racism in uh, 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 castigating the movement to boycott a racist state, in uh, saying that they merely lived in a desert until settlers came along and made it flower, in praising as social democratic heroes, I think he called them comrades in the struggle for international peace, uh, people who are, who, who are murderers. Um, it's not just that the Palestinians are subject to Keir Starmer's racism, uh, they're subject to the racism of a state apparatus systematically based on their exclusion. Uh, Shimon Peres was one of those uh, fans of the uh, norm uh, after 1948, where Israel placed Palestinians under military law until 1966. Uh, since then, of course, uh, the West Bank and, and Gaza have been occupied. Um, they're a world of racism, which some people and others don't. 
And this is really important for socialists. You know, Marx said labor cannot emancipate itself in the white skin while in the black. It is branded because the politics of domination, colonial domination, subjugation, humiliation has to be our enemy. We have to speak a language of universal freedom for everyone. That has to be the basis of our opposition to anti-Semitism. And that has to be the basis of our opposition to a Zionist state apparatus premised on the ethnic cleansing of 800,000 Palestinians and the ongoing violent expropriation in Sheikh Jarrah today, in Silwan today. If we can't oppose those things, then we're not serious socialists. You know, look at how politicians speak about Palestinians today and you get a clue about how they talk about the rest of us if they thought they could get away with it. Barnaby Rain, thank you so much for, for joining us this evening and, and speaking so powerfully, as you always do, on this topic. I, can, I, can I just say one more thing before I go? Yes, you can, Barnaby. Uh, there was, the, the, thing, the thing that was so farcical about this speech was that while it wasn't a speech about anti-Semitism, it was a speech about Israel, it showed absolutely no real interest in the actual facts of Israeli politics. It reaffirmed again the farce of the two-state solution, which Naftali Bennett, the Israeli prime minister, publicly disavows, which Zipi Khotoveli, sitting in the audience, the Israeli ambassador, condemned the board of deputies of British Jews for supporting the two-state solution. She opposes it, but she sat there applauding while Starmer said, of course, he supports it. It didn't just support the existence of the state of Israel. This speech supported the current Israeli government, celebrating the fact that the Labour Party participates in it. It's a government, and this is what we should be talking about, not just Keir Starmer. It's an Israeli government that's built 3,000 new settler homes in the West Bank, while Starmer talks about a two-state solution, that's demolishing an EU-funded Palestinian school in the West Bank while it builds homes for Jewish settlers, which recently killed a 13-year-old child killed by the Israeli army, and which is making six of the leading human rights groups, including B'Tselem that you mentioned, uh, uh, labelling them as terrorist organisations. So this is the present fact of the Israeli state. While Keir Starmer sings these hymns to minority rights and, and the progressive values of the Israeli state, uh, a, a strange hymn to the Oslo Peace process that's been dead for years. This speech was like a secondary school essay from a student using out-of-date materials from a highly inaccurate source. It was just uh, showed contempt for any of the facts of what's happening on the ground in Palestine, and it showed contempt for the Palestinian people who just don't count as far as he's concerned. Keir Starmer praised Trump's hardline attempt to exclude the Palestinians forever uh, from any kind of peace process. This is more right-wing than we've ever seen. It's more right-wing than David Cameron, who called Gaza a prison camp. Um, it's really, really very worrying racist stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Thank Barnaby, you so we'll, we'll speak soon. I know you've got an article with Navarra coming out as well. Let's go to a couple of comments. Mike Knotts, 20 quid. Thank you very much. Keep up the excellent work. I'm a monthly subscriber. I'll bump it up. You guys are ace um, on the stories we covered earlier in the show. Honey Summer says on the Super Chat, this is such an important expose of Tory ideology. I only wish we could see this in the mainstream media. Have 20 quid, whether you need it or not. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you for that. I mean, I, I feel like we, you know, we always, um, we, we put, put all of your donations to very good use. Um, we are very keen to expand this organization so we can continue um, doing this more often. Um, let's go on to our next story. We have a new entry for the most ill-judged article of 2021. It's by Rachel Johnson, who is Boris Johnson's sister, and she's decided it's the perfect moment to defend Jeffrey Epstein's best friend, Ghislaine Maxwell. So, so the headline from Rachel Johnson in The Spectator, it's hard not to pity Ghislaine Maxwell. The subheading, we met briefly at Oxford. The context of this article, so the timing, is that Ghislaine Maxwell is about to stand trial in New York, charged with sex crimes, conspiracy and perjury related to the actions of the financier Jeffrey Epstein. The indictment charges that Maxwell would try to normalise sexual abuse for a minor victim by, among other things, discussing sexual topics, undressing in front of the victim, being present when a minor victim was undressed and or being present for sex acts involving the minor victim and Epstein. So that's, that's, that's what the, the prosecution is saying. Rachel Johnson, though, the Prime Minister's sister, thinks this might all be a bit harsh. Let's have a look at her reasoning. It's hard not to feel a bat squeak of pity for Ghislaine Maxwell. 500 days and counting in solitary confinement. I intersected briefly with her at Oxford. As a fresher, I wandered into Bailey Old JCR one day in search of its subsidised breakfast granola and Nescafe offering and found a shiny glamazon with naughty eyes holding court astride a table and high-heeled boot resting on my brother Boris's thigh. 
She gave me a pitying glance, but I did manage to snag an invite to her party in Headington Hill Hall, even though I wasn't in the same college as her and Boris. I have a memory of her father, Bob, coming out in a toweling robe and telling us all to go home. I'm sure fairweather friends would not reveal they went to Ghislaine Maxwell's party, as Barbara Amiel's brilliant memoir, Friends and Enemies, proves. You only know who your real chums are when you're in the gutter. It's important to note that wasn't an introduction to an article which goes on to list Maxwell's alleged crimes and discuss how people change or how people are complex or how people who you like on the surface could have dark underbellies. No, in a column which also discusses dog breeds and whether political correctness has gone so far that we can't say women's hospital, this is all she has to say about Ghislaine. Dahlia, what, what is Rachel Johnson doing why is I she mean, doing this firstly, <laughs> firstly she's kind of throwing her brother under the bus there which you know love to see it uh but this is also it's a great example of really thinking that you're about to come and say what is on everyone's mind and just telling on yourself in the process like no rachel it's actually not hard to not pity someone uh when you pity someone like Ghislaine Maxwell when you consider the seriousness of what she has been alleged what has she she has been allegedly implicated in uh, and the wealth of quite credible evidence that is stacked against her like if she is guilty of what is being alleged she has caused untold trauma to many young women who have been voiceless and nameless for many many years and let's not forget she essentially went into hiding and so obstructed the process of finding out what actually happened and bringing justice for so many of these these women and it's not political correctness to not pity someone who was allegedly involved in a sex trafficking in the sex trafficking of young girls um for rich men it's not cancel culture for people to be grossed out by it in fact th the only thing that's gone too far is the idea that political correctness has gone too far um and and also the irony there as well of um her that that weird like transphobic dog whistle where she says you know she's talking about this in the context of you can't even say women's hospital anymore which I presume I mean I haven't read the article but I presume is a dog whistle to the idea that trans women or trans rights is somehow undermining feminism uh, which is I don't understand how she can't see the irony of throwing that in the mix and as I said she's defending a woman who is accused of grooming young girls for a sex trafficking ring in order to serve rich men bizarre move there but but weirdly I think this also actually speaks to what we what we discussed earlier on in the show which is the way in which the certain echelons um operate right the kind of boundless sympathy and and camaraderie that they have for one another no matter how awful they behave you know no matter what they do and yet the carceral and punishing mentality that they have for everyone else it's kind of the same logic it's just done here in a more in a more haphazard way because Rachel Johnson just happened to pick on one of the most unsympathetic characters uh in 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 the news at, right at the moment uh so she kind of overplayed her hand but yeah I just this article for me just showed the whole the hypocrisy and the the lack of sense that underpins so many of these kinds of columns which which decry you know cancel culture and political correctness going too far and how really it's just I want people that either remind me of myself or people that I have some kind of social connection with or people that I feel connected with in some way to be able to get away with whatever they want uh, meanwhile everyone else has to live by the rules of society and gets punished if they don't and that's really what lies at the heart of a lot of these sort of intelligentsia so-called uh you know, newspaper column diatribes on this issue. I really like that phrase, you know, in defending the indefensible, she's kind of overplayed her hand here. You know, if, if you're going to defend someone in the spectator, maybe not Ghislaine Maxwell on the, you know, on the eve of a trial into whether or not she partook in sex trafficking. Um, let's go to our next story, also on the Johnsons. Stanley Johnson, that's Boris Johnson's father, has this week been accused by two women of sexual assault. The first allegation was from Tory MP Caroline Noakes. 
who said she was touched inappropriately by Stanley Johnson when she was a prospective parliamentary candidate at the 2003 Tory party conference. Nok Noakes told Sky the following. I now regard it as a duty, an absolute duty, to call out wherever you see it, be the noisy, aggravating, aggressive woman in the room, because if I'm not prepared to do that, then my daughter won't be prepared to do that. You do get to a point where you go up with this, I will not put. Very powerful statement there. The second allegation was from New Statesman journalist Alva Ray. She tweeted after that story about Caroline Noakes broke. Stanley Johnson also groped me at a party at Conservative Conference in 2019. I am grateful to Caroline Noakes for calling out something that none of us should have to put up with, not least the Prime Minister's father. Now, what you've seen here are two statements by clearly incredibly brave women. These are also allegations which are you know, years apart, which, if they are true, suggests you know, a very concerning habit on the part of, of Boris Johnson's father who was a politician in his own right. He was, he was an MEP at one point. These are allegations we cannot confirm either way. I would tend to take them incredibly seriously. What we can say for certain is that Stanley Johnson's response to these allegations was disgusting. It was despicable. Here's what he told Sky when they put these allegations to him. I have no recollection of Caroline Noakes at all, but there you go, and no reply. Hey ho, good luck and thanks. So this is someone who has said she was inappropriately touched by Stanley Johnson in 2003, sexual assault essentially. She's also given a very powerful statement about you know the reason she is saying this now is because she wants to set an example to other women that you should not suffer in in silence. It's important that we speak out about these things so that we change the culture and in in response Stanley says Stanley Johnson says hey ho Thanks. Good luck. I mean, Dahlia, it's, you know, I mean, both the allegations, but it's, that, that response is just, it's sickening, isn't it? It's sickening. I, I have no, I actually don't doubt that Stanley Johnson doesn't have any recollection of Caroline Noakes, uh, because that's how sexual assault and sexual harassment often works, uh, especially when it's done in the context of a powerful man and a less powerful woman, uh, and and also in a in a kind of workplace workplace context. Normally, the harasser doesn't really care who the person is, uh, and considers it a kind of non-event that they probably forget before the night even ends. Whereas for the victim, it's it's harrowingly unforgettable, and that you know that's how this often goes, and that's why it's such an engine of inequality in our society because it creates this heavy, sometimes unbearable burden on a certain part of the population, disproportionately women, um, that the others just don't have to bear. Uh, and that's why, you know, we talk about sexual harassment and sexual assault as an inequality issue as much as anything else. But as you know, as you've spoken about, you know, these women have nothing to gain by publicly speaking out about this. Why would they? Why would you randomly one wake up one day and decide to lie about something that Stanley Johnson did? There's nothing really to gain here, and so for him to feel emboldened, which I'm sure he does because of the way that his, you know, that Rachel Johnson behaves, the way that his own son behaves as the Prime Minister of this country, he feels completely emboldened to do this because he feels to reply in this way because he feels shrouded by kind of cotton wool and we've allowed him in a sense to to behave that way but it also sheds a light I think on how this story often unfolds um, where you have one person who has been holding this in and holding this you know swallowing it and that causes all sorts of of knock-on effects that you might not even know are relate is related to that original thing that happened to you and you know the other person just walking through and walking through their life and not even remembering it. Uh, it's really, really chilling actually to see it play out in such black and white terms. We, of course, you know, for legal reasons, should emphasise Stanley Johnson has has denied this. You know, we we can't say either way whether or not this happened. Just that these allegations should be taken incredibly seriously. But in the abstract, I think actually that's a really important point you make, Dahlia. That you know, I suppose it also explains how one man without respect for women i'm not i'm really talking in the abstract here can affect so deeply so many people's lives because they just walk around you know the world 
unthinkingly abusing people, which is, you know, a life changing event for the person who was, you know, the victim of that, but the person who was the, you know, the perpetrator there, it's just another day. It's not even memorable. It's barely notable. The way you talked about that as, as a particular inequality of sexual assault, I think that's really, really interesting. I haven't heard it, you know, talked about in, in that way as, as much as, um, you know, I, I feel like that's a, a super important point. Um, anything else you want to mention on that story, Dahlia, before we begin to wrap up? Yeah, because I think that the point, you know, the point obviously, and as you said, you know, this is all alleged. And I think that's why we, we should sort of, it's important to talk about this in, in that, that abstract way. And, you know, what does this tell us about, about this broader thing? Because I think if you feel like, if you, if you have an, if you hear that someone has been harmed by something that you, someone has been harmed, it like, it's the lack of curiosity and the lack of any kind of respect for the fact that someone feels that way. That is so, and, and the quickness with which you can dismiss it rather than taking it seriously and having some process that we can go through um, in order to find out what happened and in order to, to, redress any harms that have happened and I think this is the problem with the way that we talk about sexual assault and the cavalier way that so many people treat it it was like in his response you just sensed that he didn't really get the gravity of what was being articulated and whether or not he remembers or believes it to be true or whether or not anything happened it's still the lack of respect and the lack of tact that is just so appalling really to watch and is so endemic um so representative in us in of the things that i was talking about absolutely that like I, I think how that is representative of, of a much wider issue is so important to you know to keep in mind um interesting comment here blidiff with uh tenor here's a tenor to stop talking about bojo's sister and start talking about galane's alleged involvement with epstein pretty please um i am taking that comment to heart i definitely want to plan some sort of show soon um, on on you know the precise details of the Glenn Maxwell case. As I say, the, the case hasn't started yet, so there will be a lot more news around this for us to report on. I would also I'll, I'll be looking out for a, for a guest on this. I think if you haven't seen already, we did do a brilliant interview with the guys from True Anon on the Epstein case. But I might reach out to try and get them back on to talk specifically about Ghislaine. Um Dahlia, a pleasure to have you back on tonight's Tisky Sour. It's lovely to be back. I, I would really love to watch that show. You should definitely sort of, I really liked the first time they were on, so. I'll, I'll try and make that happen. Um, thank you for watching tonight. Thank you for all of your comments and your super chats. We will be back on Friday at 7 p.m. There'll be lots of videos going out tomorrow on our YouTube channel, though, so do check those out. For now, you've been watching Tisky Sour on Navarra Media. Good night.